Hey, this is Jeff Waters from the Canadian heavy metal thrash metal band Annihilator, and you're listening to the one and only Sonic Perspectives. Hi there, this is Jonathan with Sonic Perspectives, and I am here with one of Canada's original thrashers and also the only guy brutal enough to make craft dinner sound metal, Jeff Waters <laughs> himself. How you doing, Jeff? <laughs> very good, but when I think of brutal, I think of the, the latest Exodus album and Slayer, but thank you very much for the introduction. <laughs> oh, yes. No problem at all. And speaking of the latest Exodus album, we should probably jump right in and talk about the new upcoming album that you've got here right now. This would be Metal 2, which I believe is due out this coming February, correct? Yeah. And for those that are not too familiar, understandably with Annihilator, we are because uh, we've kind of been out of our own country of Canada or Canada, as you almost said. Yeah. And um United States, not all of North America. We've pretty much been out of there since 93. And not by choice, just by a whole series of things. Um, but we managed to continue our career everywhere else and put out a ton of records, which people are just figuring out now, um, which is cool. But uh, yeah, I guess um, Annihilator would be a uh, heavy metal meets thrash band. We were referring to Exodus because that's one of my, of course, one of everybody's favorite bands. Um, yeah. Now, brutal that those albums are. Um, but uh, yeah, Annihilator has been like a heavy metal meets thrash band. Sometimes we're a little bit, I won't say a little bit country. That's an old song from the old days, but a little bit, um, you know, pop ballad vibes. Sometimes we're a little bit of punk and goofy and immature and silly stuff like Kraft Dinner, Chicken and Corn. What metal band possibly writes silly songs like that? And then we've got our heavier stuff and a bit of proggy stuff and a little bit of heavy metal roots and a little bit of thrash metal roots. And uh, so it's a, a big mixed bag with tons of different musicians and singers and, uh, but I didn't even know what their original question was, so you have to get me back on track. Okay, yeah, and actually, it, just to hit that digression real quick, my first Annihilator album was actually Set the World on Fire, which I think was wow. the last one you released in Canada. Is that correct? Yep. And, the last one that was re released in the States in Canada through Sony, Epic, Roadrunner, whatever it was, and, and that was it. We were dropped like a rock because um, unless you were selling a ton of records in North America, uh, heavy metal bands were generally generally at that time were dropped because the, the, the Seattle scene came in, blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows that if they, if they yeah. look at the history. Yeah. So unless I was told, unless I, unless I changed the name of the band, hired different musicians and sounded like Pantera, Sepultura or Biohazard that I'd have to cut my hair and get a real job, so to speak. And, and um, I, I did, I was pretty bummed out because that, that had been my life was playing in a heavy metal band and being a fan first and still to this day. But within one year of that being dropped from the big label, so to speak, um, my manager was instrumental in saying, why are you all bummed out? What's your problem? I said, what do you mean? I just lost my record deal. And he goes, yeah, but we're, we are already getting offers from Japan and all of Europe. And we signed with Music for Nations for Europe and uh, a label in Japan and had these new deals called publishing deals that go along with it and with different companies. And I was starting to new in the business and essentially we put out a fourth album but it didn't get released in canada or the united states and it did better it was like a huge record but nobody had heard of us and there was no internet then so it wasn't i mean it was nobody knew they thought we, we we finished and even to this day i still of course get uh people saying i didn't know you guys existed past alice in hell or never neverland or are you a new band how many albums have you put out one or two and we, we did some touring over here I mean, we've done like dozens and dozens and dozens of tours with everybody you can think of, all the names that you would have heard of in the United States. We've just done that with them in Europe. And we got, you know, one of the tours we did was a, a couple of months with Trivium and uh, many years ago. And I remember a girl coming up and asking me to sign an autograph because she just saw our band for the first time. And he said, is this your first or second album? You know, so you get that, you know, you, even kids over in Europe were starting to discover us and, and that. But. Anyway, again, once again, I've lost focus. I need more coffee. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, as an American who lived through that time period, I knew about you primarily through hand-me-downs from my older brother. So I knew about your first three albums, but I didn't get in contact with the Annihilator discography again until the early 2000s. Yeah, um, internet, internet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so getting on to the uh, the upcoming album, which is the yeah. main focus here. So Annihilator's gone through a lot of uh, stylistic evolution, especially since uh, the mid '90s when you ended up uh, switching uh, to the uh, international market. And uh, the original, uh, this album is actually a re-recording of a previous album that you did back in 2007 yeah. called Metal. And that itself was a very unique album. So let's uh, start off by going into the background of the, uh, the first part or the original version of this album. And then we'll springboard into the, uh, the upcoming uh, revamped version. Yeah, we, we've done 17 studio records so far. Our last one was out at the very end of 2019, so our, our early, early 2020, before the pandemic hit. And we'd done all our touring for that record the previous fall. So it was like perfect scenario for us, at least from the Annihilator release standpoint, because we'd done our sales and our tours and everything was kind of, you know, whatever. It, was, it just went well for us. And luckily it went really well this time because uh, you needed that little extra financial boost for what was about to come for the next few years, right? Um, but uh, the metal album we did, which is kind of a cheesy, typical Jeff Waters, Canadian, uh, ridiculous title, but it, it was actually very fitting for that record because of the guests that we brought on on that. And it was, it was one of those things where you have... Um, you're doing pretty well overseas for quite a while it's gone down for for you know from 97 to 2007 it went down so to speak but it was consistent we could still tour still make a living and still have fans and put records out but it was not what it was prior to 2007. um and then i kind of was got a kick in the butt saying you know what i'm not like a gimmicky guy i'm not into image and all that stuff and clearly i've got you know a little uh helicopter landing pad starting in the back of my head. I've got goofy mohawk and, and the kind of, at least the way I cut it, uh, self cut it. But, it, you know, I just, it's not really, I, I know what sells consistency in music, lineups, singers, record companies, consistency with management, consistency with um, styles, sounds, you know, and I was I went against the grain every record. I just said, you know, I it's really a fucking solo project and I want to work with other musicians and to new people or people along the way that hadn't really followed this in Europe, Europeans understood it was like a solo project and and you'd like one album or one singer and you'd hate the next. You wouldn't like this, but you always knew Waters was eventually going to turn it around and maybe do something that you will like. But you go to the live show and every time we played live people would love it. So that was kind of like, it was just energy, simple energy, no gimmicks, nothing. But so we had this sort of package that was perfect for an underground following to remain forever. And as long as I didn't go off the course being faithful by screw intentionally, like me staying on course meant I had to change stuff up and write goofy stuff and fun stuff and all that. So I did that and very anti-commercial, anti you know, management record company were saying, dude, do you want to like make a killing at this thing or do you, and, and have a chance to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, man, I'll lose everybody that's ever liked the band if they, they sniff out the fact I'm doing this for money. I'm doing this second for money. First is for love <laughs> music. Yeah. Um, so I kept this on and everybody was thinking you're nuts. And then when it went down a bit, I was still changing ideas and all that and music styles and having fun. And I said, yeah, but I think I got to go with the label this time. I need to do something to kickstart it, but it has to be legitimate. It can't be a, a silly stunt. So I thought, well, the first thing I did was a silly stunt idea, which was I knew some very well-known famous musicians, and some of them were not even in metal. It was more like rock star kind of guys and uh, and girls. And And I thought, hey, I think I can get these four people on. And my girlfriend at the time said to me, looked at me and goes, you kill your career. What are you thinking? I remember it was over breakfast. And I was like, what do you mean kill my career with those names on it? And it was a reality check for me. And she had mentioned, you, you have these people like wrestlers and quote rock stars that everybody knows in the States and Canada, staying over at your place and hanging out and detoxing sometimes and just, you know, hanging, right? And 
why don't you ask them? They're like kind of your buddies, you know, not best friends, but they're kind of friends. And they like what you do and you like what they do. Why don't you just ask them? Otherwise, you're going to look like you're just trying to sell records. So I thought, brilliant. So I had my little quote gimmick. It was legitimate. Um, and I had a blast. Had, I think, 12 people on from Angela Gasso, Arch Enemy, to Jeff Loomis, to, to Danko Jones, to... Oh, I don't know, Alexi Leho to Lips from Anvil to Willie from Lamb of God, Jesper X in Flames. And so I had all these people that I liked and see at the concerts all the time. And it was like, okay, label, there's your gimmick, so to speak, right? And we did the record, but the three main guys involved were my longtime drummer, Mike Mangini, who we know as Dream Theater, Steve I Extreme, but also on many Annihilator records. Dave Padden, who was my singer in the in the mid years for 12 years. Um, who had his ups and downs vocally, um, and myself, same. Uh, the three of us, it was the perfect storm where the three of us uh, kind of, that was not our best work together that we'd all done together. And it hit all at the same time. I mismanaged the schedule, mismanaged the engineering duties in the mix. Um, Dave Padden was having issues at home that he was distracted while he was singing, so he couldn't focus on getting any feel. He was just going through the motions. And Mike Mangini, of course, being the, the, the genius he is, had other gigs and he tried to rush the album going by my my drum programming and following what i'd done which was i didn't want that i wanted him to show his genius it was a complete opposite he just quickly banged it off in the weekend and at the end i'm the one <laughs> captain of the ship it was my fault and i made some mistakes on the other end uh but that was the one album that i wish i could redo and you know when bands redo, if I went back to the Alice in Hell, Never Neverland, Set the World on Fire, King of the Kill days, everybody would think I'm a total moron because why? you must need money because why on earth would you fuck with the classic albums that made your career go? And I thought, but I can fuck with that one album that had all the guests that had pretty damn good songs, not the greatest ones I've written, but pretty good ones that I was very disappointed in. And I even blame the label. This is how stupid it was. I blame the label back then SPV records in Germany for not promoting it because they had all these guests on there that gave us permission to to use them to promote it and they all said Jeff go for it you need to up your sales and we would love to be a part of helping you out because you were a bit of an influence on some of our stuff so I'm like okay I can use them I mean in a nice way I was like yes and I blame the label and then I look back and realize it wasn't the label they were given a record that was robotic production and mix robotic drumming the vocalist with no feel, but hit the notes and hit the words in the right place. And Jeff was responsible for the for the uh, absolutely not great job by everybody. That was really the, to blame. Um, and that's why it didn't get money put into it and exposure. Over, even in Europe, it, it did well. But, and, you know, I made a living off it for a few years and tour, but it wasn't one of our better received records. People didn't really know much about it because it wasn't that good a performance. So, and they didn't make the push with the money to promote the names because they were kind of thinking, hey man, if you gave us a badass record, we don't care if there's one guest or a million guests. If the record and the music and performance isn't really there, it's not there. We don't want to gamble with our money. And now I get it. Going forward, I the pandemic hit. Here we go. Ready? Insert questions now. I got COVID. My wife got COVID. Kids got COVID. And... I hit it bad. I was it was the original version of it, and uh, it knocked me out for two weeks with an elephant on my chest and wheezing like a crackling fire. Wow. I really started to think that oh, am I actually gonna die from this thing? And I didn't go to the hospital. The hospital told me that if I get one or two percent less oxygen level on my little meter, I need to come in. And they're gonna give give me the ventilator, the breathing thing. And I was like, I know what happens when that happens. You've got a high risk of of, of bad shit happening so i was being watched by my wife every fucking half hour and i slept in another room isolated and i was totally um and scared shitless because back then not only were we all scared for legitimate reasons but we were also you know as we found out later we were being scared a little overly intentionally by the media and the government so let's get back to back to reality is so i got over that after two, three weeks, but I wasn't over it. It took me about six months to get my full lung capacity back, which was never great to start with, which is why I probably got hit so hard. Then after that, I thought, wow. And that 
that fucks you up. And at that point, they're saying, oh, you can catch it a second time and it's going to kill you the second time. And I'm like, oh, no. So I was terrified like many people were. Mm -hmm. It totally sent you into a, a new world of mental instability, uh, depression, future, life, relationship, finance. Everything's put into question. And the world itself, it was just ridiculous how it was being played over here. Um, it was used politically, used politically in this country, England, unbelievably, the, the country's one of the greatest countries in the world. It actually is from an outsider, just like the States and Canada are. Um, and remember I've traveled the world for 35 years. So I've, I've got to see this stuff firsthand so long. They unfortunately got the, the unluck of the draw by getting Boris Johnson in here. And I'm not even going to say anything, but I think now the British people are starting to majority are starting to realize oh no like they're in big trouble here and they have they can get out of it but they have to move quick moving on i got through the COVID thing i got through COVID. that questions life that you question your mortality there and i started realizing okay and then after that i had hernia pain from a hernia thing that i got from singing without warming up and ripped the muscle and it got worse and worse in three months i and i ended up with surgery and it was open abdominal surgery. So not the little laparoscopic, tiny little holes. It was the whole deal. Cut nerve, everything was, it was a big operation actually. And it's been seven months now. And I've only now been able to walk 30 minutes a day. It's wow. taken that long to recover. In between, I had surge, I had kidney stones and I had surgery on two toes. So if you think all this stuff, I was thinking very early on, what if I died tomorrow? I was actually going, what if I die tomorrow? And I realized back to my band. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in Canada or the United States, you can't find our shit on, on you can find almost nothing except the first, first three albums usually um, on Spotify, iTunes, physical CD, maybe on eBay for like $40, but you can't find it. And I thought, okay, that's it. I need to go back and get all my catalog together and go to a proper company. And I knew it had to be a German company and not license it, not, not get a record deal, but sell it. And the condition was you give me very simple, give me money. And we argue, we negotiate on that. And you must put the record, get the records available, in all formats, platforms, and in all future platforms and formats. So that was it. It's gone. I sold the entire catalog off except for the first three albums and to this German label called Adel. And now they're starting a two year catalog reissue, re-release. And, and I like it because now it's going to be available next year, everything probably in a year and a half. And I could literally, it's so cheesy, but if I died tomorrow, at least my music's available. If one or a or hundred million want to hear it, it's available finally. Yeah. And yeah. I, I haven't uh, neglected what, was my life's work when you no matter what it's like good or bad or okay or legendary or shit it's still my life and i like a lot of it i know a lot of it's not where it should be but i don't think iron maiden Judas priest exodus slayer acdc nobody's done back and they never did back in black two they never did number of the beast number two they never exodus never did fabulous or bought uh, the first album again painkiller was never redone uh, or defenders or screaming uh our greatest, our favorite bands don't have 10 out of 10 albums every single time. Nobody's done that, right? Um, but, and clearly I don't. So I wanted to have it available. And, and then I would take my life now and I would try my best to finally take my health seriously because I was, and I'm an ex drinker for decades, no booze. Off and on smoker, it's been three years since I had a cigarette. And then I quit for three years, then I'd start for two years, quit for three years. So on and off. So hopefully I'm okay there, but relatively everybody thought it was healthy. They'd see me on stage and go, Oh, he's got a bit of arm muscles and he must be in shape. Well, when it were the off season, I'd eat takeout food four nights a week. I'd eat fatty foods. I wouldn't drink uh, water. I would uh, just not exercise, not walk. I'd sit in a studio and fucking sleep in and I'd, I'd basically not be lazy, but I would not take care of myself. And uh, this pandemic thing showed me with all these in instant emergency health issues and surgeries that, oh my God, you got to get your shit together. So that's what the catalog was. 
And one was like, get your house in order. And whatever happens in the future, good or bad, at least you got the past sorted. Um, so what I did with the catalog, when it was given, sold, sold, technically. Um, and then I was sitting there counting my zillions on top of my castle uh, from the sale. Not. Um, they came back to me really quick and said, listen, can you do us a favor? We are aware this is an old catalog from a band that was kind of like in Europe and Japan, a few places, legendary heavy metal band and thrash metal band and did very well. And a lot of people know us as a bigger band, but majority of it is like, right. But you go to Canada, the States or a few other countries in Scandinavia and even England. And it's like, yeah, weren't they Allison Hill, uh, you know, like 32 years ago. Um, so at least it's available. And then they said, listen, we need some help. What can we do to promote it? And we'll, we'll pay you to help us. And I'm like, you don't have to pay me to help you. Uh, it's my work. I want to help you with it. So I said, I'd do some interviews, but really they wanted me to come up with a, a an honest gimmick, I think is how I termed it, where um, something to show some attention that this catalog is coming out for those who are, who might be interested. And it's not a new release. So that's, you can't say it's a new badass album. And at this point, who fucking cares? I mean, Exodus, I care about right now. They, they, I wanted to see Holt do well. I love Zetro. Uh, it's great. It's great that Tom Hunting survived that nasty operation and yeah, an illness. Yeah. And so I wanted to see Exodus do well, bought the album right away as soon as I could download it. Um, and right. But I'm quite sure in North America, there's not a lot of people waiting for the 18th Annihilator studio record, like let's say the Exodus one for good reason. So give me something, Jeff, give us something we can use. And I said, well, what about this one album that redoing albums is ridiculous on your classic stuff because you're never going to get better than it. and You're just going to get slammed. And why would you do that anyway, in my opinion? So I, I thought, well, wait a minute. What about an album that wasn't a classic or a big seller or well-known, but it had a lot of guests on it that kind of went unheard over in North America from some awesome bands. And they're my friends and we like what each other does. And, and then I went, and Alexi Leho has a solo on there that I never released on the first one that's longer. And he passed away and he's an old friend of mine. He's been my friend since 2005. And we'd hang out. I mean, it's not just somebody saying they knew a, a dead guy. It, uh, he's my, been my friend since 2005. So um, having, having him on there was another reason why the timing was great to release the album. And then the father I never had, the musical father I never had, was second father was Eddie Van Halen because that uh, just I watched his ups and you know as a kid watched him go into his wine days and whatever else days I watched him go into what he did and behind the scenes and I tried to to really be a real fan and find out you know from industry people that worked on their albums and I'd, I'd ask questions and they would people would trust me and tell me the answers because I wasn't a journalist or someone I was just hey that Waters guy he's not going to say anything. So I got this picture of this guy, which I've never met Eddie Van Halen, never. I've had communication with him and he sent me an amplifier, but I've never met him. Like he sent me the last prototype of his uh, 2010, uh, uh, hang on, 5153 uh. from his studio. So, okay, anyway, so I, there was communication, but I've never met him. And um, I thought he passed away, Alexi passed away. You can't find a better reason than an album that you, Mike Mangini and Dave Padden did not do your best on. Mm -hmm. And there was 12 amazing people on it, amazing performances. And you did a Van Halen cover, Quietly Under the Radar, which was good in 2000, 2010, I think it was, because nobody can cover Van Halen except a couple of individuals that I've seen. Um, and Alexi passed away and he's already on the song. I just made a solo longer. Solo longer. Um, it just all fit. It was, there's your quote gimmick to sell the record if you're a label. Mm -hmm. um, but there's great people on it, great performances. Now both albums come out, so you can't say I'm shitting on the old one. I'm just having fun during the pandemic with Dave fucking Lombardo. Oh, oh yeah. Lombardo. Right. So there's the next step is, and you can insert questions wherever you want. Yeah. 
other than Neil Peart, I was thinking, well, this my favorite drummer, number two, is Tide. The drummer in the band The Knack, way back, my Sharona guy. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable jazz drummer, etc. He played with a lot of greats. He passed away years ago from, I think, leukemia. He's he's my second place tie with Dave Lombardo, Buddy Rich, and the drummer from the band The Sweet. So those are my, I've had that in my head for years, right? Since I was a kid. Those are my drummers, right? Neil Peart, I couldn't argue with that. He's by default, he's for me, number one. So, well, I can't get the two guys that passed away. Um, oh yeah, and Alex Van Halen. Alex Van Halen is not going to to be able, would never consider it, I'm sure. And it's not his kind of music and I don't know him and it, it would never happen. But what about Dave? I met Dave so many times. Mm -hmm. I tried to get him in the band uh, recording Alice in Hell in 1988, wow. 89. But the my manager said, his manager said, 25,000 US dollars plus all expenses. And that was more than our recording budget, right? So it full circle, I end up finally working with Dave Lombardo with Annihilator, but not on a brand new album, on a, a take man, Jeannie's drums, throw them away because they're already going to be on the other album. Yeah. Forget, for, take those off the record and you do whatever you wanna do. And I did the same with Stu. Stu's been one of my favorite singers before Iced Earth's or former Ice, whatever you want to call it, before Ice to Earth, John Schaefer hired Stu Block to sing for Ice to Earth. I was actually right in there trying to get Stu, but John beat me to it. Uh -oh. So I, because he, Stu actually, he's Canadian, but that's not why. He, he would have been the ultimate singer for Annihilator. That was the guy that could have done the modern heavy stuff if needed, had the Halford chops. He can sing Scream higher than anybody can, you know, all that stuff, but he can actually, as let me put it to you this way and this is totally off topic in about a year and a half from now everybody's going to hear what else that guy can do and it's going to blow your mind not with annihilator something else mm -hmm. so he's just like an untapped i don't mean gold mine because that implies money pit uh, money i'm not money pit money pile i'm talking about musically wait till you hear this guy in a couple of years I, I, the thing that we're working on is insane so so there is going to yeah. be yeah, additional work with Stu Block coming up. Uh, yeah. Fuck yeah. And All he's right. also said yes to our first three albums are kind of three quarters of the big four of our albums. And I've got the original two singers of the album, number two and number three, that if they're healthy enough and when this breaks, we're all going to do a nice set of tours in Europe, one in Japan, and then a short one in Japan, and then try to get to New York and LA just so we can get back to the States again. And basically celebrate the like 30, 31st and 32nd anniversaries of the first three albums. And Stu, when uh, we found out, of course, Randy Rampage, the singer on Alice in Hell died in 2018 yeah. or so, 18 or 19. I um, yeah. yeah, he, that was a, another loss. Um, yeah. But that was Stu and I were thinking, ooh, Stu's favorite album. You'd think with a singer like Stu, he would pick someone else. He goes, no, no, Randy Rampage. And when I was on video with him before this idea came up, he said he started singing a line from Randy Rampage from Alice in Hell album. And he sounded exactly like Randy Rampage. So I said to him, you've got to be the singer on the reunion tour for the, the Alice in Hell stuff because I can't sing this shit. I can't sing any of those first three albums properly um, and play guitar as well. So that's another one. So he's already said yes to coming with us for that. So some man i mean it's gonna when this breaks this is gonna be the time of my life if we can all stay healthy and, and keep get the world opening up but uh um i don't even know what i'm talking about so basically when steve uh when Stu, i thought of who to sing on this to redo this i did think about mangini and Patton to come and redo it and do it better but that's kind of like you had we all had our chance then let's and here's another thing i didn't do one note on this album i left it on purpose I didn't retract my bass or guitar tracks, my solos or my rhythms or my bass. I left it because it's not fair of me to jump in there and I get to fix up my shit, but the other guys didn't. So I, I, I left it. And the only two new things, three new things are Stu singing, Dave Lombardo on drums, amazing, uh, new mix and new mastering. So 
It's amazing. Great. I, just, I just wanted to ask actually on that uh, specific subject, uh, the new, uh, the, the upcoming Metal 2 album, I, I did get a chance to hear it. And it sounds very similar production wise to the, the newest stuff out of Exodus. It's much heavier, it's raw, and that's basically completely a result of Lombardo's drums being redone and the remastering and remixing. Yeah, the and, and the, guy who, the guy who mixed it and Stu's rawness, what we did on the record is, is if, if people hear about this and they go, I want to hear it, they're going to hear a raw version of Exodus. It's going to be more like, let's, let's, this is not what it's like. Exodus are the kings of aggression. I mean, violence almost, right? I mean, they are when they want to be. And when, when they hook up at the right albums with Andy Sneap, and what happened with Zetro on this new album is, I, it's like Rob Halford on Firepower, uh, the work with Sneap. I cannot fucking believe that somehow, and it's got to be Sneep, has to be the, the common thing here, how he got the vocal sound and performance out of Halford. Halford on Firepower sounds like he's 30 years old. And if you go to, if you go to the Sound of Exodus, hit and miss maybe, uh, not completely, but like some are better than the others, just like every band. But in Andy Sneep's work with the band, he just has a way of capturing Gary Holt's anger uh, Tom Hunting's feet from hell and <laughs> and the crunch. And there's something about what Sneep did with Zetro's voice. And you take these two singers that are above 50 and some above 60, and you go, how does Sneep do it? And it it's beyond going using Melodyne or Auto-Tune to fix the, the kind of out-of-key notes. I'm not talking about that. Anybody can fix notes. If you don't have the feel and the voice and the sound to start with, you can't make that better with, with changing the notes perfectly. These guys, Sneep is getting vocal sounds now. You always say crunchy guitars and his, his kind of, you know it's his drum sound when you hear it, but what he's doing with the vocals to Halford and Steve, I mean, Sneep's just nailed it. So in, in Annihilator's version, we're not heavy, and aggressive like Exodus, but for our style, this is kind of like an Andy Sneap Exodus demo. So in other words, they're not ready to, to really fine tune and that the mix and have Sneap mix it. This is more like, this was more like, we're not gonna make this a studio album, so to speak. I gave Dave, Lump, like you get this, the, word, the way I'm gonna say this, there's no way to sound silly, but I gave Dave Lombardo marching orders so to speak in a polite way and stew block the same one three takes that's it and we are not going to go into the most badass studio and spend a ton of money we don't have or need we're going to record it in our you know each of you find your own studios that you're comfortable in watch the budget have fun go do it so both Stu and dave said to me so what do you want us to do like play it like mangini and put our own stuff in a little and run it by you and i said no both the and I had him on video. I said, "Here's the deal, guys. I'm quite sure that you and I, Sturth, and you and Slayer, and Mr. Bungle, and even though Bungle's, you know, dead crosses his thing and and suicidal misfits, whatever he does, I'm quite sure that there's a producer or a Carrie King or someone that says, play it like this or do this or here's how it goes.' And I know that happened with Stu Block. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have their input, but it's being directed, un understandably, by a producer or a the music writer. So I actually played with him and I said, how's this? Three takes each. Don't do more. Don't be tuning vocals. Don't fix anything. Don't time correct. Don't put things in just because you're a little bit out on this kick drum or this. Don't fix it. And promise me you won't. And they're looking at me scratching their heads going three takes. And then what you listen and then tell, tell us what you want changed. I said, no, no, you do your three takes, send it to me, and I'll put the best take together. And that's it. And that's it. And Lombard, Dave, I say Lombardo, but I should say Sir uh, Sir Dave. Oh, no, Sir, Sir Mr. Lombardo. Um, he was just baffled that this Waters guy who's supposed to have lots of musicians and meets me once in a while in a professional environment and now I'm working with Waters and he's telling me he doesn't want any input at all to anything. And, and they love it. So guess what? I got two guys that want to work with me again. So 
it's it's like and they got paid on time and and i didn't bullshit them about anything like hey wow that's kind of unique in the music business so what you're hearing is not an andy sneep exodus proper studio album with the most badass production in the world you're actually hearing three takes from each guy <clears throat> Stu block had no idea what voice to use he's got like seven or eight voices yeah. and he goes to me the first song he did downright dominate which has alexi on it mm-hmm. jeff listen I'm, I'm feeling a bit of phil anselmo on this uh is that going to be right or wrong to go that way and i said i'm not going to say anything just fucking send me the tape and after a while and when it was done I think I made them the happiest people in the world because I'm nobody's telling them what to do. They get to do what they want to do. And just because Stu might sound a bit like Phil Anselmo here or someone else here, that's perfect because this is not a brand new Annihilator studio record. Have fun with it. We, we did get one of the top mixing engineers in the world to mix the record. Unbeknownst to him when he said yes, Mike Fraser, he's done Van Halen, ACDC, and since Thunder's uh, Razor's Edge one of the most badass mixers in the world. And unbeknownst to him, what I was gonna send him was a collage of songs recorded by 12 different guests, Dave Lombardo, Stu Block, 10 different countries, some decades old, and here's a pile of stuff and you need to make it sound like it's a record. So he, when he, was, when he got it, I think he thought it'd be a quick mix and I think he was, stressing a bit and because he's got a reputation and i sent him what he assumed was going to be a real pro thing and he got a pro thing but more in the performances than the actual sounds um and at the end of it he said i think he said the quote was something like fuck waters you better you better give me the next annihilator or project next album you do from the ground up and because he just made it sound good enough to be called a record. And that was because of Mike Fraser and the performances, not because of the actual sounds. So um, hats off to him. And, but you think about it, if you think somebody, Oh, I got Mike Fraser to mix the album. You're going to expect it's going to sound like a Van Halen album or back in black. Uh, That's not what this album is. We have an original album called metal. This is a fun thing we did to make, a little promotion of the catalog and Jeff gets to redo that one thing he he was not happy about in the past and holy shit it's Dave Lombardo <laughs> there you go that's amazing yeah so um uh the album is dedicated to uh, both Alexi and Van Halen I found it interesting the description that you gave me of the process of putting everything together specifically the spontaneity and the limited number of uh, takes uh, sounds pretty similar to the original philosophy Van Halen had when they went to record albums back yeah. in the 70s uh, I like you was never uh, able to actually uh, meet Eddie Van Halen I saw Van Halen live once and that was back in the mid 90s at the tail end of uh, that was around the time the Twister soundtrack was out. And so they yeah, were, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. were kind of declining a little bit and Sammy Hagar was on his way out, but uh, just an incredible performance on the guitar just overall. And especially that Respect the Wind solo that he did at the time. And um, I go through all the solos on this album by all these different players. And I'm seeing that same spirit of spontaneity in the album through all of those different takes on the instrument, whether it's uh, Jeff Loomis see, or Alexi. See, all of that's that. the thing. It's this thing. If you, if you went out, if a band goes out at whatever level, and, or maybe they're on a budget, because we're all on a budget, so to speak, especially now. But back then, you know, if you're like, you know, even Megadeth probably at some points in their career had to watch their budget. You know, it was a higher budget than I would have had, but they still, times have been tough since 1991, right? So for for traditional metal and thrash metal. So the budgets came in in the 90s, right? And lowering and being smarter about it, or you just didn't exist. And I think if at any point since then, there was guests like, for 2007 that was pretty badass to get that many musicians on a record that was almost unheard of and 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 actually the album was unheard in north america unfortunately but it because that would usually that 
before and after that would would have taken fifty thousand dollars just to pay off the the manager and the label for the rights to use the artists performances because the labels would have owned most of those people's performances that's the way that worked yeah. and every single this is another thing hats off to everyone on that record uh except day uh dave lombardo and Stu block they got paid the most because right it's modern times and it was you know everybody needs money and and i wanted to pay these guys good for this and have fun but everyone else guesting didn't get a penny they all went to their managers or labels and said i know i have a deal where i need permission and they politely i'm sure hopefully forcefully if they needed to said i'm gonna play on this annihilator jeff waters album just a solo and i'm gonna do it i don't want you guys to step in and start charging a fee but jeff has to have something in writing saying that they get permission get this how rare is this the music business that the artist the manager and the label all three of 12 of them said okay that's never done that's never done so when the album didn't take off because we just the three guys originally recording it just didn't have our shit together for that recording perfect bad storm for us that was the biggest regret in my recording career was not the albums that maybe sold less or that one was an experimental album in 97 that everybody would think would be the one I wish I didn't put out. It's that one because of all these guests I had on that kicked ass. Back to the budget thing. The reason why they, some recorded in their bedrooms, some recorded, and this is 2006, some recorded in their friend's studios. Some were already in the studio. One recorded on the back of their tour bus. And, and, a couple went to my studio because they were on tour and they dropped in and I said, come on and do a solo. Dave Mustaine, I think, was going to come on and play something, but that was the day after he threw a guitar in Toronto, threw a guitar at the monitor guy or whatever it was. Remember, he threw a guitar, he was in Toronto, and then after that, I think he had a day off and he would drive to Ottawa and stay with me and record his solo or thing. And then the day after was Montreal. I met him in Montreal two days after the Toronto incident, he had called me and said, I can't make it. Some shit's happening. I need to find a new monitor guy. Oh. And uh, I met him for dinner in the venue, the Bell Center in Montreal, two days after the incident, but I'd missed Dave playing on the record. So he's the only guy I asked that and didn't end up being on it because of the Toronto incident, um, which sucked because I, I like Dave and he's been a friend for a long time. And uh, and an honor, of course. I'm not I'm not pretending I'm Mister like oh he's my bud and we're on the same. I'm still a fan here, and I know the hierarchy too. Um, but I think the solos, technically, the the sounds were all over the map, and some were so bad that it's like oh god, I'm gonna have to work wonders with that back then. And that's exactly what Mike Fraser was given the same thing. So, but because it was Alexi playing, and because it was even Jesper from In Flames is not known for being some shredder, mm -hmm. but what he puts down is perfectly tasteful. Um, you've got, you know what I'm saying? It's like Lips from Anvil comes on and does, you know, at the beginning of his solo, he comes in and I'm like, I'm like smiling, like laughing almost because here he goes, right? He's here goes, here he comes. And um, because it's Lips from Anvil and he's smiling at you, he's going like this. <laughs> He, he actually recorded in my studio. He came to my studio to record, which was an honor because he used the uh, hard and heavy metal on metal guitar, Flying V, to record the solo. And he brought it to my studio, so it was awesome. But uh, anyway, the, the, the quality wasn't there, but you can see how much the playing makes up for all that. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we've gone a little bit long here, so I should probably oh, yeah. put this out now, but uh, this has been a very informative experience, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I yeah, I, I hope I didn't delay the next interview by too much by, uh, by no. letting you go here, but we covered uh, actually more bases than I initially thought we were going to get to. But uh, Yeah, but see, I told, I told you the beginning, you just need to insert the questions. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So um, uh, basically, it uh, looks like we're going to see a bit more of uh, you working with Stu Block, which I'm thrilled about because I uh, uh, don't get me wrong. I've been a fan of the of the past couple of Annihilator albums with you uh, yeah. doing vocals. But I've, one of my favorite things about the band is that every few albums we get some new blood in vocally. Yeah. This you know what? That's that's the thing about Annihilator. If you're a metal fan in the heavy metal or thrash metal genre, you're going to find some albums that you'll like, some you won't. You'll find some singers you, you, you just totally detest and some that, hey, I like that guy. And productions are the same. One minute, it, ugh, it sounds weird. And the next minute, wow, that sounds nice. So that's my whole career. And that was intentional. And I'm enjoying every second of it. Thanks for the interview. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon, right? All right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd definitely be open to doing this again down the road. And uh, full confession yeah. to the audience, this was actually my first actual uh, virtual interview. I've done two interviews before. It was all done by text, though, and it was done about 12 years ago. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, you know what's cool? It's, um, it's nice to talk to somebody from the United States because uh, it's one of my favorite countries in the world, and you're made up of over 50 countries yourself internally. Absolutely. With different rules and laws and similar ones and everything. But just, you know, I've, I've been away, so to speak, musically for so long, so many decades. But remember, I'm a Canadian, so uh, in Vancouver and Ottawa, Canada. So I've been down to the States every year, it, always, because it's essentially my favorite country other than Canada. Um, I just, uh, I'm glad I'm getting an opportunity to talk to even one person from the States. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I might be, uh, I might be your only, uh, your only Bucks County fan, unfortunately, but uh, that's good. I'm, I'm, maybe we can get eight. Hey, maybe the two of us can can generate one or two more. <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> I'll see you later, man. Thanks for All everything. Right. Thank you. Bye. Show your proof of anything I know the law, friend